At precisely one minute before midnight on March 31st, 1949, Newfoundland and Labrador joined Canada. But it held its first election on the matter 80 years earlier. For five years in the 1860s, Confederation dominated political debate in what was then the colony of Newfoundland. It all began in 1864. At the time, Canada looked very different from what it does today. It was a British colony, and it was known as the United Province of Canada. It was divided into Upper Canada and Lower Canada. In September of 1864, the United Province of Canada discussed union with some of the other British colonies in North America. A conference in Charlottetown brought together delegates from Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and the province of Canada. This was the meeting that set Confederation in motion. One month later, a second conference took place in Quebec. This time, Newfoundland also sent two delegates. They were carefully chosen to represent both of the colony's political parties and its two major denominations. Frederick Carter was there to represent the colony's governing Conservative Party and its Protestant population. Joining him was Ambrose Shea, leader of the Liberal Opposition and a member of the Catholic faith. The two men were in Quebec on an information-gathering expedition. They could observe and take part in the discussions, but they had no power to commit Newfoundland to anything. Nonetheless, the Quebec Conference converted Carter and Shea into staunch supporters of Confederation. Along with the other delegates, they helped to devise the 72 resolutions that would outline the various conditions of Confederation. These resolutions touched upon things like the number of seats each new province would have in a federal House of Commons, and how resources would be managed or money shared. On December 1, 1864, the resolutions appeared in local newspapers. They sparked widespread debate in Newfoundland. Merchants and the Roman Catholic population almost immediately opposed Confederation. The merchants worried about the new taxes and tariffs that would come with Confederation. They thought these would hurt their business, which revolved around the exportation and importation of goods. It was a precarious way to make a living. Prices could fluctuate dramatically on the world market, and they were influenced by all kinds of uncontrollable factors, like war, foreign politics, and even the weather. To remain profitable, Newfoundland merchants had to be free to buy and sell goods where they wanted and for the best price they could get. Joining Canada could take away their flexibility because of a federal tariff. Goods bought from other Canadian provinces would be cheaper, but the tariff would make anything imported from other countries more expensive. This was bad news for Newfoundland merchants. They did most of their business outside of British North America. The mainland provinces only took about 5% of the colony's exports and provided about 16% of its imports. The Roman Catholic community was also suspicious of Confederation. A majority of Catholics in Newfoundland were of Irish descent. They argued that Ireland's union with England in the year 1800 had resulted in nothing but trouble. Why should the same mistake be repeated on this side of the Atlantic Ocean? Another concern was the denominational school system. Would it be dismantled after Confederation? The anti-Confederate arguments struck a chord with the public. In contrast, the proponents of Confederation struggled to connect with the people. They said that joining the new Dominion of Canada would lead to better public services and a stronger, more stable economy. As part of a great new dominion, Newfoundland would become less isolated and would hold greater appeal to wealthy business people willing to invest in mining and forest operations that could diversify the economy. These arguments seemed vague, and they failed to rally any strong support. Opposition to Confederation remained so strong that the governing Conservatives decided against asking the House of Assembly to vote on the Quebec resolutions in the 1865 session. That same year, there was a change in the government. 
In April of 1865, Sir Hugh Hoyles resigned as Prime Minister to become Chief Justice of the Newfoundland Supreme Court. Frederick Carter replaced Hoyles as leader of the Conservatives, and he led his party to victory in a general election that November. Carter remained devoted to Confederation, but he promised to let the people decide whether or not to join Canada in the next general election. That was scheduled for 1869. In the meantime, the province of Canada continued to work towards Confederation with the maritime colonies. It came to an agreement with Nova Scotia and New Brunswick in 1867 when the British North America Act was signed and the new Dominion of Canada was formed. Unlike Newfoundland, the governments of these colonies didn't ask the people to vote on the matter. Instead, the various legislatures made the decision to unite. In the meantime, Newfoundland awaited the November 1869 election to decide its fate. Both the Conservative and the Liberal parties were divided on the issue, so the candidates formed two new parties, the Confederates and the Anti-Confederates. The Antis found a powerful leader in Charles Fox Bennett. He was a prominent St. John's merchant and mine owner. His supporters included a good number of the merchants and the former liberals, and a sizable majority of the Roman Catholic population. Prime Minister Carter headed up the Confederate campaign. But he could not count on unwavering support from the Protestant population, which was divided on the issue. Many of his former Conservative Party members also shifted support to Bennett. This was particularly true of the merchants. The anti-Confederates ran an effective campaign that resonated with voters. They argued that a Canadian government would impose high taxes and conscript Newfoundland's young men into the Canadian Armed Forces. Bennett agreed that Newfoundlanders might gain a few more public services if they joined Canada, but that the trade-off would be their independence. A popular anti-Confederate song warned, For a few thousand dollars of Canadian gold, don't let it be said that your birthright was sold. In contrast, Carter's Confederates ran a dull campaign that lacked emotional impact. They said that Canada would establish better steamship links between Newfoundland, North America, and Europe. These would make the colony less isolated and more appealing to foreign investors. Working against Carter's arguments was a recent upswing in the colony's economy. A copper mine had opened at Tilt Cove in 1864. It was owned by Bennett. And in 1869, the fishery had been unusually strong. Impressive advances in communications and transportation were also taking place. In 1866, a transatlantic telegraph cable had been landed at Heart's Content, which made the small community a hub of international communications. Steamships were also making their appearance in the seal fishery and in the mail service. There was a general feeling of optimism that the colony could survive and prosper on its own. When the election was over, the anti-Confederates had won by a landslide, 21 seats to 9. It was undeniable that an overwhelming majority of voters were strongly opposed to Confederation. For the foreseeable future, Newfoundland would retain its independence. 